The bald eagle is a uniquely North American species. It's a bird of lakes and rivers, a fisherman skillful and strong enough to lift a full-grown salmon from the water. Eagles were feeding their young all over North America before Europeans knew that the continent existed. But even the ancient Romans knew and admired a white-headed eagle from their journeys into Africa. The bird the Romans knew was a close relation, the African fish eagle, smaller and less majestic, but still possessed of the glory of eagles. The Romans conquered and lost an empire, marching under their eagle standards. At the same time, in an unknown land across a boundless sea, the Native Americans had adopted the same bird as their guiding spirit. There's something compelling about eagles that men have always admired. They symbolize strength, courage, power, all the qualities a nation wishes for itself. Or perhaps it's the places they live in. The clear mountain skies, the great forests and lakes of America are the home of the bald eagle. Once it bred in every state of the Union. But as cities and agriculture pushed westward, the places where the eagle survives have become fewer and fewer. Now it's Maine, Florida, the shores of the Great Lakes, parts of Canada, and a very few isolated pockets elsewhere, and Alaska, its last great stronghold. There are about 7,000 pairs of bald eagles in Alaska. They've been safe here for centuries, protected by the cold, the great distances, the lakes and rivers, all the things that until recently have kept men out of the north. In the whole of the rest of the United States, there are probably only about 700 pairs left. But in this bountiful land, there's peace and plenty of fish to eat. It takes 10 or 11 weeks for the young birds to grow and learn to fly. That's three months hard work for their parents. The biggest threat to the young birds can be the weather. In stormy conditions, fish can be hard to get and a food shortage spells danger to the younger members of the family. Usually two eggs hatch, sometimes three, but not at the same time, so that the chicks are not all the same size. The biggest chick rules the roost and takes the lion's share of the food. Even when the parents can catch plenty of fish for their family, there's a natural inclination on the part of the bigger chick to try to outdo his smaller brother or sister. If times are hard, the younger chick will die. As a result, by the time the nestlings are growing fastest and needing most food, there's often only one of them left. It seems harsh to us, but it means that there'll be at least one survivor of a famine. In the old days, by this stage, the chick's future would have been assured. A few more weeks to grow its flight feathers and it would be away with the adults to range over its hunting grounds. After four or five years, it would develop the white head that's the mark of the mature bird. But times have changed. Life is no longer secure for the young ones. The bird that was chosen 200 years ago as the emblem of a young nation has suffered as that nation grew up. Now, even if a pair of eagles manages to rear two young birds, the parents can't be sure that either will live to produce their grandchildren. 
The reason isn't to be found in Alaska. There, the eagle still has a secure hold on life. But almost everywhere else, it has its problems, and some of them have no obvious solution. Far to the south in Florida, for instance, the pine wilderness is perfect country for eagles, but it's perfect for people, too. The pines are being replaced by houses, while the eagles' own houses stand empty. Elsewhere in the States, people are working on the eagles' behalf. In Idaho, for example, power lines were electrocuting eagles by the hundred. Bald eagles and golden eagles, too. But we'll be seeing a solution to this problem, discovered by the extraordinary work of a falconer called Morlan Nelson. By the practice of an ancient art, he's reduced the impact of modern technology. Sportsmen sometimes shoot at eagles, although it's illegal in every state. But even when they don't, they've had an indirect effect on them in a quite unexpected way, as a university lecturer discovered in Minnesota. In many parts of America, crop spraying has had a profound effect on the environment in general and eagles in particular. Scientists have undertaken a long and detailed research operation to evaluate various different sprays. From their results, it looks as if the eagle's chances might be improving. Some people go to great lengths to save just one bird. In California, for example, an eagle was found with a broken leg. With only one leg, an eagle will starve because its feet are its only weapons for catching its food. The local vet called in a team of surgeons. The broken bone was to be repaired by bolting it together with a metal splint, specially designed and made by an orthopedic surgeon. The operation has been successful on humans, but no one had ever tried it on a bird. The injury to the eagle was not an accident. It had been shot. It took a skilled team of surgeons an hour to repair the damage caused in a moment by one hooligan. Even when the work was finished, there was no guarantee that the bird would survive. A slightly puzzled eagle wakes in a very strange place. The operation was beautifully executed, as the before and after x-rays show. Three months later, with the splint removed and his leg as good as new, he takes to the air on a California hillside. The eventual aim is to bring the eagle back to full health and strength until he can be released once more into the wild. Being largely water birds, bald eagles need to bathe every day. But being very much a full-time flyer, too, he'll need to exercise his wings before he's ready for the freedom of the California skies. This presented a problem to his protectors. The eagle mustn't escape before he's fully fit to cope with what has become, in many respects, a hostile environment. Every step of the process presented new problems. Falconers exercise untrained birds on a long leash, called a créance. A rope from a local ironmonger will have to do. The eagle's release into the wild won't be the end of his problems, because man has changed the environment in many ways, some of them subtle and very dangerous. It's all the more ironic because of all America's birds, the eagle was once absolute master of the skies.
It earned its mastery the long, hard way through thousands of years of evolution. It takes strength and coordination and practice to become a successful eagle. Hanging effortlessly on the wind, an eagle looks deceptively lazy and relaxed. It's nothing of the kind. An eagle is a finely tuned killer. It might almost be a machine, a search and attack aircraft, the specifications demand a large wing area to conserve energy by the optimal use of air currents in soaring flight. The airframe must be light and strong with variable geometry. The power plant, one fifth of the total weight, is two and a half pounds of muscle, centrally mounted low down for stability. It develops one tenth of a horsepower, four times as efficient as a man's muscles. The power is transmitted by rigid spars, hollowed to save weight, but strengthened internally by cross struts. The eagle makes use of every ounce of energy without sacrificing control. The spread feathers at its wingtip reduce turbulence at low speeds. But for powered flight, they close and twist to the rear as the wing beats strongly downwards, driving the bird ahead. At the end of the downstroke, the individual feathers twist and part so that each of them is still helping to drive the bird forward during the upstroke. Alternately beating and gliding, the eagle quarters his hunting ground. From a height of 500 feet, a man's view of the landscape is clear but lacking in detail. Because of the structure of the human eye, some small objects are just too far off to see. But for every sensitive cell in the human eye, the eagle has eight. To his eagle eyes, the details are sharp and clear, even at this range. The search is over. The attack goes in. Wings hard back for maximum diving speed. The eagle strikes, a golden eagle this time. It all happens very quickly. This is slow motion film. The first pass scares the prey into movement. And it's over. Like most birds of prey, the eagle mantles its kill with outspread wings. The eagle's power has always made it a potent symbol to men. A sperm whale's tooth becomes an eagle in the hands of a homesick sailor. The bald eagle itself has been portrayed in just about every medium you care to name, ever since it became America's emblem two centuries ago. One corner of the bicentennial exhibit at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington is dominated by an elegant tapestry. Here, the eagle has to share the stage with other patriotic symbols. But elsewhere in the exhibition, he's the undisputed star of the show. Although the eagle is accepted now, it wasn't always everybody's favorite. Benjamin Franklin sat on the committee that chose the bald eagle for America in 1782, but he had his doubts later. In 1784, he wrote to his daughter, I wish that the bald eagle had not been chosen as the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character. He does not get his living honestly. He is generally poor and very lousy. Probably not altogether seriously, Franklin preferred the turkey. He is a little vain and silly, it is true, but none the worse emblem for that. A bird of courage, who would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards, who should presume to invade his farmyard. But the eagle was chosen and all the more suitably because it was also the emblem of the original Americans. 
For example, the Pueblo Indians of New Mexico at the climax of their eagle dance. This man has really taken the eagle to heart. American Indian eagle art is a whole study in itself, with a set of traditions that equals the myths of ancient Greece or the Vikings. The old war bonnets were made of eagle plumes, but a whole series of powerful modern amulets and decorative charms indicate the place held by the eagle in a living tradition. The famous eagle vases now often show specifically bald eagles instead of the more stylized mythical birds. The mythical eagle belonged to no species. It was an all-powerful supernatural spirit. Surprisingly, it wasn't always warlike. Many Indian tribes regarded it as a protector or provider. How the eagle helped the bear in the days when the world was young is a favorite story of the Haida Indians. Long ago, they say, there was a bear who decided to feed herself and her cubs with salmon from a swift stream. Of course, in those days, this was a brand new idea. The fish were large and healthy, altogether too healthy, in fact, for they kept escaping from under her paws while the cubs waited, hungry and impatient. Perhaps bears were never meant to eat such slippery creatures as salmon. Finally, Exhausted and frustrated, the mother bear prayed to the great spirit for help. The spirit came to her aid in the form of an eagle. I will help you, said the spirit. Hold up your foot. As he spoke, he wrenched off one of his talons and planted it in the bear's foot, for in those days bears had no claws though the eagle had a magnificent armament. That will hold your fish for you, said the spirit, and vanished. Instantly, all four feet grew claws, and all the cubs' feet too. And from that day to this, every bear that ever came into the world has had fine claws with which to catch the plentiful fish in the season of the salmon. Like most old stories, the Indian legend is based on good observation. In fact, the autumn salmon run at breeding time is an important link in the lifeline of both bears and eagles. It's an essential source of food for them and their offspring as they prepare for the approach of winter. If the Indians have a powerful eagle mythology, so do the more recently arrived Americans, though theirs comes from Europe, half a world away. Heraldic traditions a thousand years old dictated that this new stone eagle at West Point Military Academy should face right, the direction of peace, instead of towards the arrows of war in its left foot as the old eagle did. Eagles have become a part of daily life in the States. It's hard to imagine Ben Franklin's turkeys in some of these settings. And have you ever heard about the illegal eagle? Well, here's one. It's a golden eagle. The sure way to tell one from a young bald eagle is that its legs are feathered right down to the feet. In 1841, the seal of the president looked like this. It was a golden eagle with feathers right down to the feet. But the national emblem was the bald eagle, 
So right up until 1882, when the seal was changed, laws enacted over the old seal were technically invalid. Even after the bald eagle was restored to its rightful place, the bird on the $20 gold piece, called a golden eagle, was, of course, a golden eagle. Mark Catesby drew this bald eagle robbing an osprey in 1725, when both birds were common all over North America. The English artist Edward Lear drew this one in 1824, by which time eagle numbers were dwindling in the eastern states. His specimen was in an English menagerie. And here's the most famous of them all, The Bald Eagle by John James Audubon, the great American bird artist painted in 1828. Still the tradition goes on. My friend and fellow artist Guy Koliak works on his specially commissioned bicentennial portrait. The beauty and accuracy of this modern portrait underline the value placed by Americans on their surviving eagles. There are few eagles left now, but there are still times and places where they rule the skies. Among them is an amazing annual spectacle in the icy winter of Montana. As the ice forms on America's western rivers in late autumn, the eagles gather for their annual conference. They're not strictly migratory birds, but hard weather brings them together for a special purpose. Along the frozen rivers, they have a reliable source of food, thousands of salmon returning to the breeding grounds to spawn and die. Where the eagles congregate, the people gather to admire their national treasure. It's freezing cold, around 10 degrees below, but the birds are a powerful attraction. As befits a national treasure, they're well protected. Here at Glacier, Montana, is the biggest meeting place of bald eagles outside Alaska. The technical word for a gathering of eagles is a convocation, a properly elegant term for such a dignified bird. In the morning, people gather on the bridge to watch the eagles feed. But in the afternoon, when the wind picks up, that's the time to see them playing, perfecting their amazing flying skills. This may look like a dogfight, but in reality, it's simply a game between youngsters. Just look at that barrel roll. Eagles are among the most skillful of all flyers and it's easy to see why when you watch them in training. Now we can't get inside an eagle's head to know what this gathering means to the birds. But the convocation is more than a collection of individuals. They establish a pecking order among themselves while they're here. It's quite possible that the young birds which meet here are beginning to form pair bonds, which will endure until they die. They mate for life. The pairs of adults which arrive here in the autumn will leave together at the turn of the year to return to their family nesting sites. This year, there's an encouraging number of brown-headed young birds. If these young birds are ever to grow up into white-headed adults, they'll need protection. And to find how best to protect them, we need much more knowledge of their way of life 
and the ways in which it's affected by human activities. One human activity that has affected all birds of prey is spraying crops with pesticides. It's an essential part of agriculture, but one that seriously endangered the American eagle. One effect of the sprays has been to make the birds lay eggs with thin shells, eggs that usually crack before they can hatch. At the Wildlife Research Center at Patuxent in Maryland, Dr. Stanley Wiemeyer measures the thickness of eagle eggshells. His findings indicate that this year's shells are getting fractionally thicker again, thanks to the increasing use of less harmful pesticides than the notorious DDT poisons. In some respects, at least, the American environment is getting cleaner. This is particularly encouraging to the staff at Patuxent. They've succeeded in breeding bald eagles in captivity. It might seem that breeding any species in cages is a limited exercise. After all, they'd probably die if they were released now. But the Patuxent birds, fed on a special clean diet, will be the foundation for a new wild population when they can be released into a new, cleaner environment. The work at Patuxent is supported by field studies in many parts of the country. Before you can study eagles, you have to find them, which is no small job in the wilderness. In Minnesota, Dr. Tom Dunstan uses some ingenious tricks to track down his subjects. This dead pipe contains corks to keep it afloat, as well as a tiny radio transmitter. The pike, neatly stitched, goes into the lake. The glint of a dead fish will attract any passing eagle looking for food for its growing family. If all goes well, the eagle will carry the pike to its nest and the radio signal will show Dunstan where it is. Any eagle that flies overhead could have picked up the bugged pike. Dunstan checks them all. His receiver will detect a signal anywhere within a mile. After a couple of hours of patient searching, his scheme works. He spots an eagle giving out a strong signal and marks the spot where it perches on the edge of the forest. Before long, he's at the bottom of the nesting tree. As nesting trees go, it's a modest one, about 65 feet tall. But the nest is in the extreme top, where the trunk has been broken off. Not an easy sight to work. Tom Dunstan is a university professor, not a professional tree climber. But what he lacks in expertise, he makes up for in determination. One of his students waits below, probably wondering if his professor will survive to give his course next term. At the top, the nest proves to contain one well-grown young bird just what Dunstan had been hoping for. A small chick would have been no good for his purpose, and two grown youngsters would have been too much of a handful. One proves to be a handful enough. Although the eagle's only a youngster, it has to be handled with care. It can already defend itself quite effectively. Lying on its back, though, it'll stay relatively docile once its eyes have been covered. Neatly tucked in a canvas bag, the young bird is gently lowered away. When the eaglet is safely on the ground, the processing can start.
First, though, the humans must be protected from the most dangerous weapons in the eagle's armory. These stiletto-sharp talons can do a lot of damage. It took one radio to find this chick, and the principal reason for finding it was to attach another radio, a permanent one this time, a micro-miniaturized transmitter which the eagle will carry when it moves south in the winter. The yellow stripe which will lie along its back conceals the aerial. The whole assembly weighs less than two ounces. The harness is specially designed not to hamper the bird's flight. Once Dunstan is sure that the harness fits perfectly, the young eagle can be restored to its eyrie. The first time Dunstan performed this experiment, he was worried that the parent birds might reject their bugged baby. But experience has shown that they won't be upset by their offspring's yellow streak. The eaglet has a few moments to recover, and then up it goes. The signal from the eaglet is clearly audible from out on the lake, and one parent is already returning to the nest, so all's well. Soon the young bird will be flying on its own, and Dunstan will be able to follow its every move with his tracking equipment. Using this technique, Dunstan has identified the route that the eagles take to their wintering grounds along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. But here he came upon another mystery. The eagles here were found to contain large quantities of DDT. The question was, how did it get into their food chain? Eagles generally feed on fish, and the fish here are relatively free of the stuff. To find the answer, he collected and x-rayed some pellets, the indigestible parts of their food that eagles disgorge after a meal. In practically every one, there were duck bones and shotgun pellets. The eagles had been feeding on ducks, which they were catching only after the ducks had been wounded by shooters. Because they've migrated from agricultural areas further north, the ducks around here contain a lot of DDT. The unsuspecting hunters were harming the eagles by leaving so many wounded birds. Further south, in the prairie states, there's another problem for the eagles. Many sheep farmers shoot them because they believe that they take lambs from their flocks. It's an old belief held by the American Indians and even by the ancient Greeks. Perhaps once or twice over all those centuries it might have happened, but it's never been documented in modern times. It's true, though, that eagles are common in sheep country, but it's not the sheep they're after. It's the prairie dogs that make their homes on pasture land after the sheep have thinned out the grass. On rundown pastures, the prairie dogs multiply and the sheep often go hungry. As a result, at lambing time, there are deaths from malnutrition and disease. Soaring over it all are the eagles, bald and golden, who've come to prey on the prairie dogs. But if they do locate a dead lamb, they come down to scavenge the corpse. It's one of the eagles' useful jobs in life. All it takes is a passing sheep farmer to see them at it, and the guns are out once again for the innocent eagles. A misunderstanding like this can be explained and corrected, but some of the eagles' problems just don't have an answer. For instance, the Florida Keys used to be a great eagle stronghold. But a powerful tide of human expansion is flowing down there these days, and it's engulfing the birds. In these shallow waters, the fish could provide for thousands of eagles. In days gone by, this was where the great chases between eagle and osprey were to be seen. The eagle robbing the osprey of its prey but now the osprey can fish alone in his own good time, with no watchful eagle to pounce on him on his way home.
Ospreys are beautiful birds, and in Florida they're still quite common. But ospreys without eagles are like Hamlet without the prince. The mangrove islands, the Keys, are superb nesting sites. Once upon a time, this was the kingdom of the eagle, dotted with its ancestral castles. Now the castles are deserted, with just a few lonely pairs of lordly birds living out the last days of the old regime. On the family nest, one of several they've built over the years, a pair starts off another breeding season. It might well be their last. If it's getting lonely out in the Keys, the pine wilderness fringing the Everglades is practically deserted. Here, the human tide has swept all before it. Desirable living space for eagles is also desirable for men. Every year, square mile after square mile is converted from wilderness to building plot to someone's home in the sun. They're nice enough houses in a perfect climate, but so was this. The builders have left an eagle's nest here in a lone pine, and maybe when the houses are finished, the eagles will come back, or maybe not. Things look bad in Florida, but they're looking brighter in the central United States. In Idaho, Morland Nelson is working to protect eagles from a very special danger, electrocution. He's a falconer, a practitioner of a very ancient art. Nelson's little prairie falcon is a distant cousin of the eagle. Its trainer has helped to save the lives of hundreds of its bigger and more powerful relatives. Morland Nelson has been flying birds of prey since he was a boy. To exercise the bird, he uses a lure a duck's wing on a cord. It's a game between man and bird, a test of speed and coordination a game that traces its history back thousands of years to the ancient courts of China and Arabia. Finally, the man gives the lure to the bird. The game's over. For Morland Nelson, a falcon was the beginning of a lifelong adventure. Now he trains eagles as well. His golden eagle has been his partner in a unique piece of research, vital to the protection of all eagles. Idaho is open country. There, eagles and other birds of prey often use electricity poles, as if they were trees, for hunting and feeding perches. That can be highly dangerous. If a bird cleans its bill on a cross arm and its tail happens to touch a live wire at the same time, it's dead. After 500 eagles had been electrocuted in the state in four years, the local electricity company called Morland Nelson in to advise them. The very first field trip produced evidence of the deadly potential of certain types of pole. This was a young golden eagle. The broad white areas in wings and tail show it to be a first year bird. It would just have been learning to fly. Sad to say, not all dead eagles found near power lines are electrocuted. A lot of them are shot, either because farmers think they're vermin or just for what some people think of as sport.
Here, a whole nest had been shot down, and part of the insulators on the pole. There wasn't much Nelson could do about deliberate killing, but he could help to prevent the accidental deaths. His accomplice was to be his trained golden eagle. Behind his house, he'd already erected a dummy electricity line with materials supplied by the power company. Okay, get the first job was to train the eagle to fly into the danger area. Then the plan was to film the bird landing and taking off from the poles. Nelson could then analyze the slow motion films. The eagle wears a hood over its eyes to keep it calm while its trainer sets bait on the dummy pole. The bait is a small piece of meat, not a meal, just a snack. Birds of prey must be hungry to be on their best behavior. Falconers call it being sharp set. Training takes a couple of days, sometimes longer, with the eagle on a leash. Soon he'll learn that he can always find food here. Like all falconers, Nelson calms his bird with little sounds and gentle talk whenever it looks nervous. It soon settles down when it discovers the food. The lessons must go on until Nelson feels confident that the eagle will fly to the pearl when it's released. And finally the day comes. The cameras are set and the trials can start. Now the eagle's flying free. And here are some of the slow motion films they took. For a young bird like this one, the insulators are too slippery for a safe controlled landing. On a live line, those flailing wings could have meant its death. Now for another trial. The problem is either shorting two wires or earthing one through the pole by touching its lightning conductor. Watch closely. There. If the lines had been live, that eagle would have been dead. Each trip to the pole means another snack for the eagle, but it's safe to go on working it for a few more runs. Takeoffs can be just as dangerous as landing. A study of his slow motion film showed Nelson exactly how the eagles could be protected by readjusting the distance between the cables. This trained eagle flying free in the sky of Idaho has helped to make life safer for thousands of wild eagles. On modified power poles where the central conductor has been raised and the earthing arrangement altered, even novices can land in perfect safety without the risk of touching two wires at once. Adding a simple wooden extension to the poles can cost the power company a lot of money. But like many people, they think an eagle's life is well worth it. Also, it's good public relations. And so the shareholders' money is well spent. Eagles often build their untidy nests on steel pylons, a convenient site but far from safe. If the sticks were to touch a conductor, the nest could catch fire and the chicks would be incinerated. Power company engineers now actually climb up to these nests with saws 
to trim overhanging sticks. Only five years ago, this engineer would probably have been up there with a long stick to push the nest off. It's all part of the good news for eagles, a sweeping change of attitude brought about by the work of men who are determined that the American eagle will win its battle for survival. The mother eagle returns to her tidy nest. Power poles have become part of the eagle's habitat, and not only as feeding and hunting perches. Morlan Nelson has designed a nesting platform too, which the power company is attaching to existing poles to provide a stable base for the nests. More and more poles have become the opposite of death traps. They're breeding places for the most majestic of America's birds. With the help of the citizens they represent, the eagles are fighting back. These young people, members of the Youth Conservation Corps, are part of that small army battling to save the American Eagle. They're blocking paths in the Chippewa National Forest to keep winter sportsmen out to protect the eagles from disturbance by skiers and noisy snowmobiles. It's not a big step, but it promises to be surprisingly effective. The fact is human activities and eagles don't mix well anywhere. And work like this ensures that they don't have to mix at all. The protection the eagles are getting from government, universities, various private industries, and just about every section of American society, including schoolchildren, is having results. The eagle's numbers have stopped falling, not only among the snowy mountains, but even near Washington, where they're 25% up in the last two years. With continuing care and protection, the bald eagle could now survive to roam his native skies far into the future. You might even say the eagle is coming home. But just how far it is from home became clear six months after we filmed Tom Dunstan fixing the radio to the eagle in Minnesota. He wrote us a letter to say that after he'd followed the eagle 320 miles to its wintering ground, he saw it once more in a parcel sent to his home by a colleague. It had been shot dead with a rifle. So there's still a long way to go before the bald eagle is really safe.